Hello, my name is Brad Neal with the University of Indianapolis, and this is a continuation of the section 3.2 material from the textbook. Okay, so we've talked about percent compositions. Now it's time to talk about empirical formulas. Um, empirical formulas can be determined using the flow chart that you see and that came from the reading. Um, what I would like to do is work through this example problem with you and call out some of the key things here to figure out the empirical formula. Okay, so to get us going here, I'm going to switch our view. And so here we go. Now, one of the key things that uh, you're going to find with these empirical formula problems are you're going to need to know, to know the masses of your compounds to start out with. Now, this one's pretty straightforward. This one is telling you, telling us that we have a hydrocarbon, just like we had in uh, previous examples and readings in the book. We know we have a hydrocarbon because it's only giving us carbon and hydrogen. Sometimes, for more advanced problems, um, and we might do one of those here in a little bit, or we can do one in discussion section, um, and they definitely are in your reading. Sometimes they're going to, the book is going to give you um, something that's going to say you had a total mass. And then after combustion, you figured out how much of it was carbon, how much of it was hydrogen, and the rest of it was nitrogen. And so then you're going to have to say, well, how much was nitrogen? Because it doesn't explicitly tell it. Well, it kind of does because it says the rest of it. Because it says the rest of it you knew how much you started with for your total compound, you can do some subtraction and away you go. More advanced problem, we'll work our way up to that kind of thing. Right now we're gonna do this one because it's a better one to learn off of. So to do the empirical formula bits, what we're gonna do is we're gonna wanna make sure that we have plenty of space to write across in a problem like this. So we might end up uh, here on the slide run out of space um, but I suggest the way that I think it works better for students is to try to make sure that you can write all of this in one line or as much as you can, because then you can kind of keep all of your carbon stuff in one track and you can keep all your hydrogen stuff in one track and whatever ad other atoms are, uh, in there. So let's go ahead and let's get started. So to do these empirical formulas, we want to write out what we know. We've got 1.71 grams of carbon. Now an empirical formula is going to be a relationship of how many atoms we have to compared to the other atoms in the formula. So this is going to be an atoms to atoms relationship. Atoms to atoms requires us to be in units of molecules, atoms, ions, particles, what have you. Or it requires us to be in units of moles because moles is a count of how many things we have, not how much of a thing we have. Gra mass, grams, measures how much of the thing we have, not how many of them we have. So we got to get from grams always into moles. And if we decide to go on to molecules, particles, ions, etc., we can, but we at minimum have to get into moles. So how are we going to turn our grams of carbon into moles of carbon? Well, that's where we're going to go to the periodic table and we're going to figure out what our atomic mass of carbon is. And we're going to remember our definitions for atomic mass units and how that can convert to our molar mass or our atomic mass, etc. So you're going to look on the periodic table and you're going to see it's 12.01 grams of carbon for every one mole of carbon. And so then if we do this now, we're going to have grams of carbon that are going to end up getting canceled out and we're going to be in moles of carbon, which is fantastic. Um, and if we stopped right here, we're going to type this into our calculators and the one point, let's see here, it's going to be the 1.71 divided by 12.01 and you always got to remember to not actually type the number into your calculator correctly. That's a joke. Always make sure you type it in correctly. You're going to end up with some, some kind of small number like 0 0.14281. Go ahead and write out all of those numbers at this point. 
and don't forget your units, which are going to be moles. Now let's go ahead and let's do our hydrogen. So we've got 0 0.287 grams of hydrogen. We're going to treat it the same way as we did the carbon. So the 1.0079 or 0 0.8, depending on your periodic table, grams of hydrogen over the one mole of hydrogen equals. And so type it in your calculator. Very exciting television right here. 0 0.287 divided by 1.008 or 79. I wrote out 79, so I might as well just type in the 79. I know it looks like it's really close to 1. Go ahead and type it into your calculator. Don't take the shortcut there because um, these numbers tend to, these kinds of problems tend to uh, revolve around precision. Um, and having the actual numbers. If you don't have the actual numbers, you end up messing stuff up later down the line. So whatever your calculator says at this point, just go ahead and write it out. So we've got 0 0.28475 uh, moles. Now, hopefully you were screaming at me through the screen to put my atoms there. Okay, and then I know that the carbon's kind of cut off, but all I wrote was a C. Congratulations, everybody. We have done the yellow boxes and the orange boxes on the little uh, flow chart that's above my head. We are now to the point in time where we're going to divide by the lowest number of moles. Now, why are we going to do that? I'm going to scroll this down just a little bit. We are hopefully remembering that our chemical formulas are our lowest like uh, whole number ratios for our, or our, I'm sorry, our empirical formulas are our lowest whole number ratios of atoms to atoms. So we need these things to be in whole numbers. So what we've got written out here are not whole numbers. To get them to their least common denominator, the easiest thing to do is to take the one that you have the least of, and in this case, it's going to be our moles of carbon because it's the smaller number, and divide both of these by that number. And I'm going to you know, make sure I write that one in, and then it's going to say moles of carbon. And then I'm going to take this and divide this by the 0 0.14281 mole of carbon and my head's kind of blocking it so I'm gonna go ahead and hide the PowerPoint here for a second the, there we go go do the do yourself the favor write out the moles of carbon here the moles of carbon here write out the moles of hydrogen here the moles of carbon here. The reason you're doing yourself a favor is you're going to then be able to say one mole of carbon for every, or we can do this ratio here, for every one mole of carbon. And that should only make sense. But here, when we type this in, we're going to pretty much end up with two moles of hydrogen for every one mole of carbon. That's going to give us our ratio. So this right over here, if we read this correctly, that's going to give us the ratio that we need. So our empirical formula then will be able to say there's two hydrogens for every one carbon. Typically, though, we're always going to write hydrogens after our whatever <laughs> that they're attached to. So we're going to end up writing out CH2. If we turn back what that problem said, it is we are now to the point where 
we have divided by the lowest number of moles. We are now in a ratio that has the lowest possible whole numbers. Congratulations, this is our empirical formula. Now, I know that right now, like that whole convert ratio to lowest whole numbers thing, we kind of skipped over that, but that's because it was already a two to one. There's gonna be scenarios where, and I'm gonna make this up right now, this is me making this up. This is not what the problem really said. This, the CH2 is your empirical formula for the problem we just solved. In a new problem, sometimes when, when you do the division stuff that we did up here, instead of ending up with like two moles of hydrogen for every one mole of carbon, you might end up with something that is like two moles of hydrogen for every 1.5 moles of carbon. So that would tell you, oh, I've got C1.5H2. How do you have half an atom of carbon? I mean, short answer is you don't, right? So what we have to do is we have to use a multiplier. And the multiplier is going to multiply the numbers here on the bottom so as to still retain the lowest whole number ratio possible, but, but they're going to be whole numbers. So an easy multiplier here would just be to multiply everything by two. So we would end up with C three H six. Nope. <laughs> C three H four. Woo. Whole number ratio. It doesn't actually change anything in a negative way. It only affects things in a positive way because now we have a chemical formula where everything has a whole number of atoms and we can't have half of a carbon atom to begin with. So this is indeed the right answer. What if you ended up with um, something like C1.25H2? Well, what could you multiply by? Well, why not multiply by four? And then you end up with C5H8. So you can really multiply by whatever number. Oh, yeah. You can really multiply by whatever number right down here. That's appropriate so that you still have the lowest whole number ratio possible. The worst thing that's going to happen is, is you multiply it by a number that's too big. And so then you end up with something like, um, let's say you ended up with C4H8 because reasons. Well, you could say, well, I can simplify this to CH2 if I just divide everything by four. And that's what you would do because this right here, the C4H8 is not the lowest whole number ratio. Thus and therefore, it is not the empirical formula. The C2, or I'm sorry, CH2 is. So that is the basics behind empirical formulas. If you have, let's see here, let's see. Okay, so the molecular formula, let's go ahead and let's solve this problem here real quick too. Um, the molecular formula is a situation where now a little bit more information is given to you. In this case, it's the same number with respect to the mass of carbon and the hydrogen. It's just now telling you what the molar mass of your species is. So anytime you're determining a molecular formula, you're going to start out doing the exact same kind of work that we just did here because you need to know what your empirical formula is first. So you would do all of this math again, come up with your ratio of CH2. I'm kind of cu cutting that off. The CH2, there you go, CH2. And then you're gonna apply that equation that is on the slide. So it's your molar mass and that's gonna be divided by your empirical formula mass. Form by y'all. 
the difference between your molecular mass um, and your empirical formula mass is the empirical formula mass is going to be based off of just that CH2 because that's our empirical formula. So it's going to be the 12.01 grams per mole plus the 2 times 1.0079 grams per mole. That will end up equaling 12.01 plus 2 times 1.0079 grams per mole plus 1.079 and we get our 14.0258 grams per mole. This number goes into that part of the equation. So writing it out, we get the molar mass, and the problem gives us the molar mass, 78.11 grams per mole over 14.0258 grams per mole equals some number. So 78.11 divided by previous answer, and we get something along the lines of, did I do that math right? 5.569. In an ideal world, in a nice ideal world, this number here is going to be a whole number. For whatever reason, when I double checked this math earlier, it worked. Right now it's not. Not really sure what's going on here. But what this should have been was 6. It should have been 6. What I believe has happened here is I gave you all, as the students, the wrong number right here. This should have been a little bit bigger. This is just, be I'm saying this to you because I know what I meant for this to happen. If your answer at the end of a problem ends up like this, this 5.5 or not a whole number, go back and redo your math. Um, there's a chance that something is screwy right now though. Like I've done my math now twice um, and I'm still coming up with that half number. I know I messed up the seven point blah, 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 blah right here. As long as you report it the way that it comes out and your math is right, and if it's an error on my part, that doesn't mean a deduction of points on your part. Let's say though, to finish this out, it really hadn't come out as intended and it was the six. What does this ratio number then mean? Well, our empirical formula was C6H2. The six would then tell us multiply every number down here. So there's like a one that's implied here under the carbon. Multiply every number down here by six. The formula that comes out here at the end is then going to be your molecular formula. So this right here is your molecular formula. Punch line, so to recap, to recap, you take your known molecular formula that's given to you, that goes there, you take your calculated empirical formula that goes into your denominator, you figure out what your ratio is, you have an instructor who gives you a ratio that's actually going to work out and be a whole number because they're always whole numbers. You take that whole number that you get, it comes over here, you multiply all of your ratios by said whole number and you get 
final answer such as it is. That, ladies and gentlemen, is empirical and molecular formulas. There are additional practice problems in the textbook, and please let me know if you have any other questions. Thank you very much. See you next time.